Imagine, an old, tireless traveler far from home. It has been journeying for more than four decades, a silent witness to the grand, lonely emptiness of our solar system. This traveler is Voyager 2. On November 5, 2018, something extraordinary happened. After billions of miles and a lifetime of discovery, it felt a sudden change in the wind. The familiar breath of our sun, a constant stream of particles called the solar wind, suddenly vanished. In its place, something new, something alien, began to press in from all sides. The cosmic rays of the galaxy, a storm of high-energy particles born in distant, violent star deaths, finally had their say. Voyager 2 had done it. It had crossed over. This wasn't a violent explosion or a dramatic crash, it was a quiet, profound transition. Think of it like a boat leaving the calm, protected waters of a massive bay and entering the powerful, unpredictable currents of the open ocean for the very first time. Now it was truly adrift in the interstellar sea. Where did this incredible journey begin? We have to go back. Back to 1977, a time of disco music, bell-bottoms, and a once-in-a-lifetime planetary alignment. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. This cosmic billiard shot offered a unique opportunity. A spacecraft could use the gravity of each planet to slingshot itself to the next, a gravity assist that would dramatically shorten the travel time. It was an irresistible call to adventure, and NASA answered with two of the most ambitious explorers ever conceived, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Their mission was called the Grand Tour. Voyager 2 launched first on August 20, 1977, followed by the faster Voyager 1 a few weeks later. They were marvels of their time, packed with instruments to study planets, rings, moons, and the magnetic fields that surround them. They revealed volcanic activity on Jupiter's moon Io, hinted at a subsurface ocean on Europa, flew through the majestic rings of Saturn, and gave us our only up-close views of the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. They rewrote our textbooks. But the grand tour was just the beginning. After they completed their planetary flybys, their journey was far from over. Bolted to the side of each spacecraft is a golden record. It's a gold-plated copper phonograph record, a message in a bottle for any intelligent life that might one day find it. What does it really mean to leave the solar system? It's not as simple as flying past the orbit of Pluto. Our sun is more than just a ball of light we circle. It's an active, raging star constantly spewing out a stream of charged particles. This stream is the solar wind. It travels at a million miles per hour creating a gigantic protective bubble around our entire solar system. This bubble is the heliosphere. It's our home. It's the region of space dominated by our sun's particles and magnetic field. Everything inside this bubble, planets, moons, asteroids, comets, is bathed in the sun's breath. Imagine our sun as a giant sprinkler in the middle of a dusty field. The water shoots out in all directions, clearing a large damp circle around it. The heliosphere is that damp circle. But what happens at the edge of the circle, where the water's force finally dies down, and it meets the dust? That's the heliopause. It's the boundary where the outward push of our sun's solar wind is no longer strong enough to push back the wind of interstellar space. It's where the sun's influence ends, and the galaxy's influence begins. It's the true edge of our solar system's environment. It's not a solid wall but a turbulent, dynamic frontier. Beyond this boundary lies interstellar space. This isn't a perfect vacuum, it's the medium between the stars. It's a thin cold soup of gas, dust, and plasma forged in the hearts of ancient stars and blasted across the galaxy by supernova explosions. This interstellar medium is filled with galactic cosmic rays, atomic nuclei that have been accelerated to nearly the speed of light by some of the most violent events in the universe. Our heliosphere acts as a cosmic shield, deflecting most of these dangerous high-energy particles away from us. As Voyager 2 crept closer to this mysterious boundary, the scientific community was buzzing with a mix of eager anticipation and nervous uncertainty. What would we find on the other side? The hopes were enormous. Scientists hoped to finally measure the true density, temperature, composition of the interstellar medium. This would be like tasting the water of the deep ocean itself, not just the brackish water near the shore. They hoped to understand the shape of our heliosphere. Is it a perfect sphere or shaped more like a comet with a long tail? There was also the great magnetic field mystery. Our sun has a magnetic field. We theorize the galaxy does too. How would these two magnetic fields meet and interact at the heliopause? Would they connect smoothly or clash in a turbulent storm of energy? Finding out would reveal fundamental truths about cosmic structure on a galactic scale. The data from Voyager 2 promised to confirm models or shatter decades of theory.
but with great hopes come great fears. The interstellar medium was a completely unknown environment, some worried the density of dust particles might be much higher than predicted. Voyager 2 was traveling over 34,000 miles per hour, even a tiny grain of dust could hit with the force of a bomb, that could damage or destroy the spacecraft's aging systems. It had survived 42 years, but this new region was the most hazardous it would ever face. Another fear centered on the galactic cosmic rays. We knew they existed but not their full strength. Once Voyager 2 left the heliosphere's protection, it would be bombarded by intense radiation. Could its 1970s-era electronics withstand the assault? It was a race against time. Voyager 2 had to gather data and transmit it before interstellar space claimed it. How does a machine, now more than 11 billion miles away, still talk to us? It's an incredible feat of engineering and honestly a testament to human ingenuity. Voyager 2 is equipped with a suite of scientific instruments. It has a magnetometer to measure magnetic fields detectors for low-energy charged particles, so it can sense the solar wind, a cosmic ray subsystem to count the high-energy particles from the galaxy, and a plasma wave subsystem, which can detect the oscillations of plasma. Basically, it can hear the waves of charged gas it flies through. These were its eyes, its ears, its fingertips. The heart of its communication system is a large 12-foot diameter high-gain antenna. This dish has to be pointed with pinpoint accuracy toward Earth, a target smaller than a pinprick of light from Voyager's view. The signal it sends out is incredibly weak. By the time it reaches us, the transmission is just 20 watts about the same as a refrigerator light bulb. Spread over billions of miles the signal that arrives is unimaginably faint, billions of times weaker than a digital watch battery. It is, in every sense, a true whisper from the void. To catch this faint whisper, NASA uses the Deep Space Network, or DSN. This is a global system of massive radio antennas located in California, Spain, Australia. By having stations spread across the globe, we can ensure that we are always in contact with our distant probes as the Earth rotates. The DSN antennas are enormous, some as wide as a football field. They are the most sensitive radio receivers in the world, capable of plucking Voyager's faint signal out of the cosmic background noise. It's like trying to hear a single pin drop in the middle of a roaring stadium from thousands of miles away. The data doesn't arrive instantly. Because of the immense distance, the radio signal, traveling at the speed of light takes more than 16 and a half hours to get from Voyager 2 to Earth. When Voyager 2 finally crossed the heliopause its data streamed back to a waiting Earth, it painted a picture both expected and utterly surprising. First, it confirmed the primary theory, the solar wind vanished. The instrument measuring solar particles saw the count drop to almost zero, a sharp drop in solar particles and a simultaneous sharp rise in galactic cosmic rays. At the exact same time the cosmic ray instrument lit up, the number of high-energy galactic cosmic rays surged to levels far higher than inside the heliosphere. We were no longer shielded. This was direct, irrefutable proof we had entered a new region of space. But the details held the real discoveries. Scientists had expected a messy transition. Voyager 2 showed the boundary was remarkably sharp and distinct. It crossed this frontier in less than a single day. The edge looked like a surprisingly well-defined line. It was like stepping a single foot out of a doorway and finding yourself in a completely different room. Different air, different light. One of the most fascinating discoveries came from the plasma wave instrument, the one that hears space. As Voyager 2 approached the boundary, it didn't find a smooth wall. It detected a complex, layered region before the final exit. There seemed to be a magnetic barrier or plasma wall, where interstellar medium piled up against the heliosphere like snow piling up against a snowplow. The plasma on the other side was denser, colder than some models had predicted. Voyager 2 had to push through one final, unexpectedly thick layer before it was truly free. Furthermore, the data revealed the interstellar magnetic field was stronger than expected. This powerful magnetic field wraps around our heliosphere, shaping it and squeezing it. This confirmed our solar system isn't drifting passively through the galaxy, it actively interacts with a magnetized interstellar environment. While many findings confirmed our theories, one discovery truly shocked the scientific community and made headlines around the world. Voyager 1, which had crossed the boundary in a different location six years earlier, had not been able to see. Voyager 2's plasma science instrument was still working, while Voyager 1's had failed decades prior. This single, functioning instrument revealed something incredible. 
the plasma of the interstellar medium was significantly denser and warmer than expected. It wasn't just a cold, empty void, it was a dynamic, energetic place. The empty space between the stars was not so empty after all. The true world-stopping moment was the way the boundary behaved. Voyager 1's crossing had been somewhat ambiguous, leaving some room for debate about exactly when it had crossed, but Voyager 2's crossing was clean, sharp, and undeniable. The data was so clear it was like a textbook diagram come to life. This clarity provided what scientists call a golden event, a perfect data set. It was a Rosetta Stone for understanding our home in the galaxy. The world of astrophysics didn't literally stop, but entire research projects pivoted overnight to analyze this new perfect data. Another surprising fact emerged from comparing the two crossings. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 crossed the heliopause at different locations and at different times in the Sun's 11-year solar cycle. The boundary Voyager 2 crossed was smoother and thinner than what Voyager 1 had experienced. This suggests that the heliopause is not a static, rigid shell, instead it breathes, it expands, it contracts, its shape likely ripples, its shape changes in response to the Sun's activity and the pressure of the interstellar medium. Our solar system's protective bubble is a living, dynamic thing, not a simple sphere. It's more like a jellyfish than a cannonball. Voyager 2 had not just measured a boundary, it had revealed the very nature of our cosmic sanctuary. Why does any of this matter to us here on our little blue world? It matters because for the first time in human history, we are no longer just looking at the stars, we are among them. Voyager 2's journey is a fundamental step in our evolution as a species. Just as our distant ancestors once walked out of Africa to explore the continents of Earth, we have now taken our first tentative step into the galactic continent. This discovery isn't just about plasma density and magnetic fields. It's about understanding our home's place in the universe. It's about knowing the environment that our descendants may one day have to navigate. This knowledge is crucial for our future in space. Any future mission that aims to send humans to another star system will have to travel through this interstellar medium. Thanks to Voyager 2, we now have a much better idea of what to expect. We know the radiation levels we'll need to shield against. We know the density of the plasma we'll have to fly through. We know about the magnetic fields we'll have to contend with. Voyager 2 is the scout that has mapped the treacherous waters ahead making the journey safer for all who will follow. It's the first chapter in the guidebook for interstellar travel. This epic journey also inspires us. It reminds us of what we can achieve when we are at our most curious, our most ambitious, and our most collaborative. The Voyager mission has lasted for nearly half a century, outliving many of the scientists who first designed it. It's a multi-generational quest for knowledge, a baton passed from one generation to the next. It's a story that tells us that long-term thinking and peaceful scientific exploration can yield the most profound rewards. In an age of short attention spans, Voyager's slow, steady, 48-year and counting journey stands as a monument to patience and persistence. Ultimately, Voyager 2's discovery connects us to the cosmos in a tangible way. We are not separate from the universe looking in. We are part of it, and now, a piece of us is part of it in a new way. A human-made object carrying our music, our languages, and our story is sailing on a galactic wind, and it proves that even a small species on a small planet can, with enough ingenuity and wonder, touch the stars.